Ladies and gentlemen, we are here for one incredible episode. I can say already that it's incredible because I am here with a person that I already consider a living legend. And even though he might not consider himself as so, <laughs> we were just speaking, um, you will understand why this, um, why I have uh, said that. I am here with um, Derek Nakamoto. Welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, <laughs> and this man has contributed a lot in the music scenario, more than uh, most of a lot of people can imagine. And our mission here today is to talk a little bit about this and, and go a little bit through his contribution on music, his thoughts on the jazz music and, and music in general, and also to, of course, help us understand a little bit of his whole contribution in the music scenario. Um, to understand a little bit of what he does, um, if you allow me, I'll just read a little bit of your biography. <laughs> and he and it goes, as, um, it's a veteran producer and composer. Derek Nakamoto is looking at an illustri illustrious 30-year career of producing and arranging for some of the most influential music artists and composing original music recorded by some of the world's most prestigious ensembles. His extensive music background has allowed him to work on a variety of eclectic projects, from string arrangements for Grammy-winning artists and production credits to full orchestra scores, Derek forges textures and harmonies from different cultures and eras into a unique piece that is sure to move the audience. Um, Derek believes in carefully casting every ensemble he uses on each recording. He maintains close relationships with some of the most talented instrumentalists, engineers, and recording venues in the LA area. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Derek Nakamoto. I have applauses here somewhere. <laughs> uh, Welcome on. If, if you were to introduce yourself, um, how would it be? How would you introduce yourself? I would introduce myself as a, I am a musician uh, and I am a seeker. I am a very, I have a very curious spirit. Uh, and that curiosity has led me to experiences uh, that I did not realize maybe at the time how special they were. Uh, but in wonderful interviews like this, where it's one of the few times where I do get an opportunity to think back and go, yeah, I guess that really did happen. <laughs> I'm a very fortunate person who really has been in a lot of places just at the right time. That's all. Nice, nice. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, so let's, we'll get back to you as um, as a person and as a producer. Um, but let's talk about today that it celebrated the International Jazz Day, the mm. April the 30th. So I'm pretty sure you have a special relationship with, with jazz and, and eventually a lot to say about it, right? So, um, so if you were to describe the importance of jazz in your career, um, what would it be? I, jazz is, I would start by saying that music uh, has been and is one of the most important vehicles that we have to build bridges. It crosses borders, uh, culture, ethnicities, uh, and jazz, I, I honestly never considered myself a jazz musician. Um, I, my heroes were jazz musicians. And I 
and I started to notice later that it, it wasn't just the, the dexterity or the amount of chops that a musician had. It what garnered my curiosity was where they drew their inspiration from and how in manifesting that of creation, how it moved people. And I've heard it described in many ways. Well, one of my mentors was a, a, a French composer named Michel Colombier. And Michel was absolutely brilliant, uh, unfortunately passed much too young. Uh, he was at the forefront of blending classical and uh, R&B and jazz elements in a record uh, called Wings way back. So I, I was telling him that I, I don't feel like I'm a jazz musician. And he stopped me and he goes, what makes you say that? And it, it the way he did it, he's a Frenchman, but he it very, <laughs> stop. <laughs> what makes you say that? And he says, jazz is not about all the dexterity and the chops. It's, it's the ability to draw something out of nowhere that is um, fueled by pure emotion or circumstance. Because you are as much of a jazz musician as uh, any of your heroes. And in some ways, he goes, you do things that uh, when you tell me what you're going to do, I don't think is possible. And then when I hear what you've done, it blows me away. And this is you know, to hear that coming from your mentor. Uh, that was pretty amazing. So jazz, I have a very, uh, maybe a little different uh, understanding of jazz. But I think when I have the conversation with musicians, uh, it, it uh, forces them also to go inward and think deep and realize that uh, jazz is really special. It's drawn from inspiration. It mirrors uh, every emotion in the human spirit. And it has the ability to convey that to the audience. It, it's very, very powerful. Awesome. You, you mentioned um, heroes. You... Oof. <laughs> there are, are <laughs> there are many. I mean, the, the, the artists that inspired me when I was young were uh, Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, uh, Aerto, Wayne Shorter. Um, it, it, they were just amazing what they did and how each one had their own unique character, their own means of expression. Uh, and especially, I had an opportunity to meet Herbie once, um, and to be, uh, and, and Wayne Shorter, very briefly. And, and it was also their humility and the fact that they were human. They were human beings. They did not think that they were extraordinary, mm -hmm. but they were very clear in their purpose their responsibility as artists and what to do with it and what they're gifting. And I thought that was amazing. Uh, but they were my, Herbie and Chick were my biggest influences. And Weather Report on a bigger scale mm -hmm. with Joe Zawano and uh, that, that incarnation really changed my life. <laughs> Honestly. Have you had? Uh, have you ever had a moment in which you thought that a certain musician's personality doesn't match what you always thought of him? Um, you don't have to mention names. <laughs> no, you know, it, it's very interesting. I have never, of the great jazz musicians, uh, they have exceeded what I thought. Mm -hmm. I find that what you just described more apparent in pop music. Mm. And the reason being, especially in the last couple of decades, like, boy, I can talk in decades, 
in the last <laughs> two decades, especially, uh, many of them don't have a clear idea of who they are. They they have a very clear idea of the success that they would like to achieve, uh, and e and the I guess the the percentage you know where you you enter into it and you end up doing something that you don't you may not really believe in with, with your heart, but you figure well I'll get to what I want to do later. But as the success comes, uh, it's very difficult for them to do that. So I have seen tragic, um, really tragic uh, trajectories of artists who were extremely successful, but uh, sort of living a lie or not honest to their craft, mm -hmm. to their heart, to where it destroyed them. I think we, there's a number of them, a very high profile people uh, even, so I encourage artists uh, to be themselves, speak their yeah. truth. Very important. So that's, as far as you know, your question, uh, that's where I have seen people where you, know, you, you see one thing and then you meet them and you go, well, I probably appreciated you at a distance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but not, but uh, in terms of jazz, I don't think I've ever met any but he, the few that I have met that were my heroes, they were everything that I imagined them to be, and in some cases, more. Awesome. So speaking on impressions, uh, I'll bring up a name, Louis Armstrong. Boy, <laughs> you talk about, especially with, um, with black artists, um, Louis Armstrong was was a diplomat. You know, he played music that really transcended. It was appreciated by everybody on such a mass level. Uh, and at the same time, you know, when you you learn the backstory of many of these artists from that generation, how difficult their lives were. And while they were appreciated on one level, uh, they were subhuman on another level. And uh, and I have more respect for them now because I, I realize the grace that it took for them to do what they did under those circumstances. And Louis Armstrong was phenomenal. What a, what a heart. And his recordings are a testament to that still yeah. played, still enjoyed. Awesome. You, you mentioned him as, a, as an ambassador, um, and I can mention that he has traveled to at least, let's say, 14 countries, African countries, <sighs> and he has been loved. Everywhere he passed, he was just loved. And what makes you, um, in your opinion, of course, what makes people um react so good not just to him as an artist but to to the art it, to the art itself so let's say to jazz itself do you think there's a particular um element in jazz that makes just so many people love it oh i i thought about that uh in the 80s i worked with a lot of japanese national artists that were aspiring jazz artists that would come here and try and uh, uh, we would gather, I guess, the best uh, contemporary jazz musicians to play on their records. And I, I could see that they they technically had the chops. They technically knew all the notes, but there was that intangible thing missing, soul. Oh. And that, and when I would talk to uh you know, especially my black brothers. And they, they took me in when I first moved to Los Angeles, the R&B community especially. And we would talk about that and say, what do you think it is? You know, these are phenomenal musicians. And they go, oh, they play intellectually, learned. 
we play life. Wow. This wow. is what we grew up in. We are the culmination of our experience. And that is what makes American jazz really unique, really special. It's, it, it's just everything. You know, all one's life experiences is channeled through that melody, that note, and you can feel it. Uh, and I think when musicians perform jazz around the world, even though there may be a language barrier, the music speaks, the emotion speaks, uh, and it's very powerful. So uh, that, I think, is the power of jazz. Wow, amazing. <laughs> so, um, Derek, um, so I was, I'll throw also other names. Um, like Duke Ellington, Dave Brubeck, again, Ooh. Louis Armstrong. <laughs> so they all bridged um, cultures through music, you know, and you've worked with so many artists over this course. Um, would you consider yourself like a musical, a music module, for example? And what is one of your most memorable projects? But let's go in parts. Would you consider yourself a, a music module? Oh, no. <laughs> Why? I would consider myself uh, really fortunate. I, I, in a real, because of other uh, interviews that I've done recently, uh, one thing I became aware of, of myself was uh, I was lucky to be in. Uh, I guess a mainstream, the the gold, what they call the golden era of recording in Hollywood, yeah. which was the eighties, nineties, and I was lucky, you know, to work with some of the best, uh, the musicians, engineers, uh, and artists. Um, and what equally, I I've done a lot of work with music community artists. Uh, artists who are activists use their music as a vehicle for their activism whether it was social cause uh, humanitarian spiritual relations uh, and what i notice most important were the only separation between what they did and the mainstream artists were budget and acts and budget allowed access to information, to technology or people in the know. So what I love doing is taking what I knew on one end and bringing it over to the other, helping those folks. As artists, I, I felt some of the most amazing uh, creations or spirits I were meeting were folks in the community. They're just doing music as a as a means of expression, and they really did not care about the the other stuff, the fringe benefits. And so I was lucky um, in my career. I had little windows with uh, different artists that were considered uh, that have that really are not considered. They were iconic. And but there were small windows, and maybe because of my curious, a curious nature, and a desire to learn about the moment I was in, uh, I really took in every moment. Yeah, and there were small windows. There were people working with these artists that had far more involvement and impact. Mm -hmm. But I was there at moments, you know, from uh, the Michael Jackson probably one of the most famous. Uh, I was working with a partner. Uh, I, I would, actually, he was he was amazing. Uh, he is amazing. He's still alive, John Barnes. And John took me along. And John started a company with Michael called, uh, oh, God, Experiments in Sound. And we flew to Florida and set up in the BG studio and created what was the first incarnation of a 
smooth criminal. And so in that week or two weeks, uh, Michael Jackson can be perceived as many things uh, by many people. But in my mind, you know, it, it is undeniable his genius, the way he created. So I, I have that experience. I have uh, the experience of seeing Whitney Houston, again, a very small window on her first album, where, you know, white t-shirt and jeans. Just, just like a just a normal young person, um, but the how extraordinary their talents were. You mentioned one name I, I do want to mention because I did spend time with him was Dizzy Gillespie, and mm -hmm. uh, Dizzy, we shared. I was in a lounge band doing show tunes, uh, playing opposite Dizzy. And his trio, and we were we were so embarrassed, you know, with our, <laughs> with our our suits on, and we're jumping up and down and doing these harmonies. And then here comes Dizzy on stage. We're exchanging forty five minute sets. He comes on stage, and it was ungodly good, just him. And then all of us were shoved in a little dressing room in the back. And uh, in between sets, we were talking, and I, you know, we told him, he says, my God, you know, you, <laughs> you're Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> we're so damn embarrassed doing this shit, and here you are doing. And he stopped us and goes, why do you say that? Where am I when you folks are playing? I'm sitting back here. I love what you folks are doing. It takes a lot of practice to sing those kind of harmonies and much less to do it live. Don't ever be embarrassed at what you do. Don't I I'm just up there doing what I do. We're human beings. Just trying to you know do music on a, on on the best we can and boy that that really um it was such a humbling experience to see his humanity, to see his heart. So that experience always sat in my mind. Humility. It's not, they didn't think any more of themselves. They were just trying to play music. Uh, and another one of my, my heroes that I met was Donny Hathaway. Uh, who uh, growing up in Honolulu, I, I listened to all his records. I emulated everything he did. We were this band I was in, did a gig in uh, Indiana. We get off the bus, uh, and there's Donny Hathaway's name on the marquee. And I couldn't believe it. Throw all my things in the hotel room, go downstairs into the lounge. And said, it can't possibly be. And there he is with the band. Wow. Uh, we, he played a set. I was floored. I came up to him after and I says, uh, I don't want to take any of your time. I'm from Honolulu. You, your music shaped my life. Uh, what an honor to be able to thank you. That's it. And he looked at me and he said, uh, come here, sit down. And he talked to me for an hour. And it was kind of uncomfortable because people were coming up to him and he just, <laughs> he would kind of, <laughs> you know, go away, go away. And wow. he was talking about life and the trappings of the music business um, and to be careful. And I thought, my God, you know, what, what's, I was, it was a surreal experience. I was 20, in my 20s. Uh, and he shortly passed away maybe a couple of years later. So I've had windows like that throughout my life. Oh, and uh, Where at some points I thought, God, how come I didn't just stick to being a producer or being this or that and just stay in one niche, call it a day. <laughs> uh, my, my journey has been really diverse. Um, and I keep asking God, what 
is the reason for all of this. It has to be leading to something. Uh, and I know we'll get to it later in the uh, interview, but what it did lead to was meeting Valdemar Bastos. Yep, that was Which actually was going to be my, my, my next question. And how, how, how is it? How did you go? Because um, Valdemar, Valdemar is, um, we always say, and I always comment every time I talk about him, and I always say he was so far ahead. Uh, yes, like, yes, yes. Speaking on the music scenario here in Angola, and I was just, I was reading your biography and checking some of the songs you've, you've uh, worked on, and I see um, Velia Chica, which is a, a symbol here in the country, and it's like, wow. So he's the man indeed. <laughs> How was it? I look at myself in the mirror and I ask, you talk about being blessed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we met through another uh, mutual artist. Um, and, uh, I think, um, God, I forgot the record company. I forget names when I'm thinking about so many things. There was a record done with a collection of African artists singing U2 songs, uh, almost in appreciation for the awareness that U2 had done uh, for the African continent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Valdemar was one of the artists chosen and he, they picked a song called Love is Blindness and the person setting it up said, oh, you should do, the, I have a guy you should meet. I think you would work well together. So Valdemar came over to my studio. Uh, he did not speak much English at the time. We had, a, we had an interpreter, but we connected and we got along and I loved his guitar playing. It was unique. Uh, there was a it was a voice going on in his playing that I had not heard, and and he smiled. He kept pointing at me when I would say something about the guitar, and he looked at me and go. <laughs> and when he left, he says, "I'm going to come back here. I want to do my record with you." And I thought, "Great! I would love to see you again." And we parted, uh, and then a year later. Uh, he showed up at my door wow. and he did not remember. He remembered where I lived, but he had no address, no phone number, nothing. He had a friend of his drive through the neighborhood until he recognized the house. Wow. And, Lo and Los Angeles is big. Yeah. Uh, and so he showed up and I'm laughing. I'm going, Valdemar, what are you doing here? And he goes, I told you I'm coming back. <laughs> I want to do my record here. And the and so many stories evolved in the making of this record. It took a long time to do, I think over a period of six months. Wow. Uh, but a, a few weeks in, he told me I knew I was I wanted to do my record here because I saw you in a dream. I saw this studio in my dream. So when I met you, I knew you were the person. Uh, and that floored me. He was a he was a very spiritual man. No question. And God, uh, he had a special relationship, and it guided everything he did. It was the source of everything that he sang or all his actions uh, so and i i was told you know we had we were doing the chica it, iconic song and, and there were wonderful recordings of it and he told me that yeah they're good but it's not the way i imagined so the record we did was built around him and we paid careful attention to uh, the songs were all built around him and his guitar playing. Mm -hmm. And then I, I orchestrated everything around it. Um, 
I think that was a big difference. Uh, he, each song had a story. Each song had a particular way he wanted the story told. Um, he was extraordinary. Wow. Um, I go on tangents, so feel free to stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. Uh, oh. I'm, ast I'm astonished because, um, as I said, he's such a great art, uh, such a great artist. So, uh, hearing that, and from someone who um, had him that close from a personal level and from a creative um, perspective, uh, and having the confirmation that um, again, it's not someone that you just admire and is let's say different in on the other side and it's just amazing to know that um he matches uh what he has always passed the energy that he always uh, that he always passed to everyone including us that only heard from a distance so that's that's amazing he loved the people his people he loved his country um that was an, we talked about that a lot. Uh, there were many, I would say even second to his musicianship was he, he was a humanitarian. Uh, he felt things much deeper, I think, and then sometimes even given credit for. Uh, I, and I, I think, uh sometimes it's good uh to um work with somebody who does not know much about what you do we're just interacting in the moment yeah you know his previous um experiences or his fame or accolades you know i i really did not know of and it wasn't important what was important was the person uh in front of me and what he wished to do and i i feel that that is a powerful tool especially i have a phrase now that i i speak much of uh, the the need to rediscover civil discourse learning how to talk to each other learning how to listen to each other with no agenda uh, that has served, been such a beautiful vehicle, framework for uh, working with the artists that I have worked with. It wasn't me making a mark on what they did. It rather really trying my best to understand what it is, what it is that they're trying to get out and for me to create the framework around it. A supportive vehicle for them to be comfortable doing what they do, what they want to do. Uh, Voldemort's record just grew and grew and grew, and it what was amazing was uh, when we ended up putting the London Symphony on it, and he, <laughs> I, it, you know, it started out as an idea, and he goes, "No, I, I want a symphonic element, very important." And I, I did mock-ups of the arrangements with, with synthesizers. He loved it. And he goes, oh, you wait, I'll come back. And then he come, came back and called me. He goes, oh, it's okay, let's do it. <laughs> and it was one thing like that after the other. And what amazed me was, you know, when, we're, when I was traveling around doing the recordings, especially in London, how much his music moved the orchestra. Some of the people were very emotional after the recording. Some came up to me after saying they had known of him and were fans. And I went, my God, this man's music really <laughs> it just gets out there. It transcends, transcends the world. So I think uh, when I am asked well, what was... Uh, you know, one of the more important works that I've had the privilege of being a part of, it is definitely Valdemar and this 
this album. It really doesn't get much better than that. It, it's not just the music, which is extraordinary. It's the entire, the entire experience, watching how it developed mm -hmm. and getting out of the, uh, getting out of our own way and just letting it take a life, the life that it wants to have. Uh, he he was. I miss him. <laughs> yeah, I really we, miss him. I, yeah, he he's he is a person to be missed. <laughs> he's great. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so you have mentioned um, traveling uh, quite a lot to because of work, because of uh, recordings. Yes. And I'm pretty sure that uh, moments like the one you saw, um, you, you mentioned that you saw Valdemar playing guitar like you've never seen. And, and, and then you, uh, the other day you're in London with an orchestra, the other day you're somewhere else, the other day you're back in Cali. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you get a lot of um, other cultures in your music. Oh. The taste of other cultures. So how do how do you how do you emulate it? How do you incorporate then? How what, how does it play a role in your music? Oh, it's I. You start to see the thread that connects everything. Uh, I remember uh, I grew up. I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, and let's see, in the 90, maybe mid, no, mid, early 2000s, I had the opportunity to go to South Africa. Prior to that, I was a fan of some of the music that I was hearing coming out of South Africa, especially in the choirs, uh, the harmonies. Uh, when I went there and listened and met the people, uh, I could hear the, uh, ignore that. <laughs> I could hear the similarity in the harmonies and it, it freaked me out. It, there was, maybe it was the missionary influence, uh, colonization, you know, but that imprint, but there was something in the way it was sung that was so reminiscent of Hawaiian music, mm -hmm. Polynesian music. And it, I felt at home there. And it's the same. I also did work in Los Angeles with gamelan groups. Um, just very diverse, different music uh, styles, genres. And I could see the oneness in everything. So I would incorporate, wow, that, that groove, that rhythm makes makes people feel a certain way. Let's incorporate that uh, because it, it not only did it make people feel a certain way, it also fit with the music. It gave it another flavor. Mm -hmm. And the subtext for that for me as a producer was introducing another culture or another genre of music to an audience that may not know it, building a bridge. Uh, what I... One event that I was a part of is uh, I produced a double CD of live recordings for the World Festival of Sacred Music in 1999 in Los Angeles. And the it was a decree by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to usher in uh, the millennium with a series of concerts around the world that were not rooted to any any particular tradition or ideology or philosophy it was purely spiritual music mm -hmm. and what the festival director here did in los angeles was take the music um uh, and have it performed in non-traditional places non-traditional spaces so you would have Ind indian music played in synagogues uh jazz played in buddhist temples it, it was a way of using music to introduce a culture to an audience that 
normally would not have access. And the results were unbelievable. It was a, it was just amazing. The way people responded to it, uh, their curiosity woke, their fears subsided uh, through music. It wasn't political. It wasn't, uh, you know, a, a particular religious tradition. But because of the music, people started asking questions and became comfortable uh, engaging in, in conversation. I never forgot that. It's not just the rhythms, you know. I, I incorporated it in the productions that I do because it feels good and it's right. And it, it to me, it makes the music worldly. But I uh, lately, when we're living in a world that is so polarized, out of necessity, different people are forming their own groups to find comfort in like-mindedness that it's scary to see that in doing so, they also are becoming part of the problem. More isolation, more yeah. polarization. And music to me is one of the last vehicles where we can break through all of those barriers, which is why I'm so supportive of events uh, like International Jazz Day and the collection of artists that are coming. And it breaks my heart that I am unable to be there, uh, especially with the group of musicians gathering to honor Valdemar. Yeah. Uh, you're doing something something special is happening in Luanda. Uh, and I and, and all the young artists, you have a great collection of artists coming. And uh, my curiosity always is, I want to meet the young artists. I want to meet the ones that aren't on the stage, the ones that are <laughs> aspiring. Uh, and, and tell them, you know, while America has been the, I know I'm going, really going off, but the important no, thing is that <laughs> America has for the longest time been the beacon of many things. Uh, how diversity is going to work together. But let's say specifically music, the appreciation of jazz, because it is an American art form, truly one of the music that you can say is American, like gospel. Uh, um, and while maybe in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was... It was really strong here, um, and and we knew as artists, we knew. I've had jazz artists talk to me saying, "God, we go to Europe, we go to Africa, South America. We're like gods here. We're lucky if we play in the back of a Denny's restaurant. You know, we're we're not as appreciated here, but abroad, it's loved, appreciated, respected, um, and they they wonder why that is and. I said, well, it's fairly obvious. Look at the faces of the people listening to the music. Look at the way the music is lifting, lifting them. Um, we as Americans need to pay attention to that yeah. and realize that, you know, we're, we're so busy creating these commodities. We, we have to forget, not forget the heart. Uh, but what I am very excited about is I saw a shift uh, starting at the millennium where artists in their own countries are, um, are starting to find their own voices and express it beautifully with their own unique feel, their own unique interpretation. This is jazz. And they're creating a new form a new form of jazz because it speaks to their experience, mm -hmm. their lives, their environments. Um, I think it's exciting. And, and countries are developing their own infrastructure to support that. So I encourage young artists to look in their own backyard mm -hmm. for creativity, uh, build 
good relationships with with the people right around them uh, it's not necessarily what's going on across you know the neighbor's backyard much less in another country or across the giant pond yeah there's wonderful things happening right in your own places and i love then when musicians do come over mm -hmm. it, it's a cross cult it's a cultural exchange of ideas yeah. yeah critical that's critical more important than ever awesome boy uh, um... <laughs> <laughs> sorry no 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 uh, it actually leads me to 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 a question that is um so you know that um the jazz the american jazz ambassadors they have um so they have balanced they found a way of balancing their love of music um to you know with the tensions of racism mm -hmm. and segregation you know they were still able to 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 work with that and so they used their performances overseas to you know, to just reinforce their com their commitment to equality. You know, they wouldn't care. They would just do their thing because you saw that they love what they loved what they did, what they were doing. So, um, much like in the same way, Angolan artists um, also use their music, and it's not just in jazz. You see it in other music genres as well. They they use their um, music as a way to protest. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Qualities, um, anything that happens in politics that they're not, they, they don't agree with. Um, and what's your opinion on using music as a way to um, protest, as a way to um, speak up for something, for, for something that, um, you know, that they don't agree with? I, I believe that that has been a powerful tool of music for decades. Uh, it is a wonderful way to get a message out in a way that makes it accessible. Uh, I also believe that as artists, we have a responsibility to the craft that we do. And I uh, always speak to people to encourage them to define to their truth, to be aware, to be open-minded, and responsibly uh, create their art that speaks to that truth. Um, music has always been a vehicle to get messages of, of protest, dissatisfaction um, out there. Uh, it's a it's a difficult time now, uh, a challenging time. I know in our country we have the um, Asian hate movement that's rising. And I'm watching how my Asian brothers and sisters are reacting to it. And it's very, it's interesting to see how it, the difference between the age groups. You have the, you know, my age group, you have the millennials, you have the Gen X, Gen Z, and everybody is seeing it through a different lens. And I, tell my elders it, it's my peers not my my elders most of them are not here anymore but my my peers my age group that we it's important to share our stories absolutely and it's equally important not to plant our fears our hate our negative experiences into young people and then, and then f expect them to carry on our battle. Uh, we have to listen to them too, because they they have a different lens that they're experiencing the same thing. You know, everybody is looking at this. So I I 
think by being encouraging people to be responsible in what they create, being steadfast in that truth, will and the respect. You know, when we listen to music that we may or lyric that we may not agree with, but to listen with an open mind, that's where change can come. And it is also important. Uh, I know as an Asian American, it is important to put myself out there, my best self. Uh, yes, I am of Japanese, Chinese ancestry, uh, which I'm very proud of. And I, but most I'm a human being, I'm a musician. Yeah. Uh, and I think by putting that out there, uh, will create the positive change that I would like to see, that I want to be a part of, create civil discourse, in my case, our, our case, through music, our art. Uh, so that's a responsibility, I think, that artists need to be aware of and exercise in, in the creation of their art. Um, but it is an important time not to be quiet, not to have, not to be quiet and uh, thinking that that is go going to affect the change that we want. We, n we need to speak up, especially when we see things that are uh, wrong, just wrong. We need to speak up. Uh, and I think as artists, we have tools that can do so in a way that like no other. So uh, I, I encourage it. I think protests uh, can, will affect positive change if it's you know, mindful, rooted in truth, done responsibly. But it has to be, and it also has to be done fiercely, passionately. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, pandemic, we are all leaving this. Yes. Um, at the time, some more than others, and but the numbers are still increasing, um, and a lot of industries have been affected, and yes. I feel like the musicians, the music industry, has been affected severely. Um, especially in countries like Angola, for example, we don't have a streaming industry that is powerful enough for people to um, just survive over plays and, you know, just streaming in general. So a lot of our artists get their income from um, performing live. And mm. that's, um, that's a right that was taken off uh, mm. the for, for a long time now, you know, things are starting to get back, um, but um, still not in the same rhythm. So um, you had a lot of artists who were just doing this for a living. And so if they cannot sell CDs or um, perform, you know, it's really, 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 really hard for them. What, what are your words of encouragement, especially for Angolan artists in that, um, you know, living this time, this really hard time? COVID has definitely put a screeching halt you know, on live music around the world. And many of my touring friends, I it breaks my heart. Everything just stopped. Uh, I think for uh, dealing with the pandemic, it, you know, it, we know we listen to the science and we we adhere to it. Uh, but I think, especially with young folks or creative minds, you, one door closes, you look to another, you open up another one. I know what I would encourage uh, for Angolan artists is to develop, develop your own infrastructure, develop tools that will help uh get your music out um it's a great 
it's a great opportunity to identify what is needed, what is lacking, and to to build, to develop it. And these are things that can be done uh, with COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very fortunate here to have my home studio. Um, I love working in outside studios, the right studio for the right project, which creates a vibe. However, uh, because many of the artists I work with do not have large budgets, a lot of the work takes place here. So I was lucky. I had my studio pretty dialed in, pretty much in place before the shutdown here. Uh, so work for me continued through the pandemic. Uh, I did not have very good streaming capabilities. It wasn't something that I did. But I got that together really quick. Mm -hmm. You know, technology, calling friends, and everybody helping each other through the internet to create the best possible experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I would encourage um, Angolans to do, to use this opportunity as uh, throwing a spotlight on infrastructure that needs to be developed or 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 built and everybody pulling together resources to make these things happen to whether it's uh, accessibility development and accessibility of broadband internet so that it's easily available um, people that can uh, develop non-traditional recording spaces that are can be extremely competitive and develop product that's competitive. It's the technology is there. I think the human know-how mm -hmm. to dispel what we see on TV or what we see the um, uh, artists that we love. You know, maybe they are showing how their records were done in these big, beautiful, extremely expensive studios. If you that's saw cool. where we did Valdemar's record, it was in my converted garage studio. He loved it. But mm -hmm. after working many years in Los Angeles, I knew how, what to do in that room, in that uh, 500 square feet space to make it sound good. And when Valdemar sang, the, it rattled. <laughs> the roof rattled. His voice was so big. But it, it, it was something about the natural woods in there that, it colored the sound in a beautiful way. Beautiful. So when people think they need this or that to make something great, I can go, well, my experience might be a little different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So I would, that's what I would say to Angola, to develop for the young artists, look, start developing your own infrastructure. And and I think there are people out there who can come if they need knowledge or uh, different ideas on develop. There's people out there that would be uh, open to helping that happen with no other agenda other than seeing um, uh, young artists having uh, creating a, a vehicle, a, a competitive vehicle to make their music. I think that's exciting. Yeah, 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 you know, there are no more gatekeepers. We start <laughs> to create our own art. Yes. Yeah. Speaking on creation, that leads me to you specifically. How, and that's something I'm really curious. Um, hearing the stories that you've um, shared, um, tell us a little bit of how your creative process works. How do you go about creating a song? Yeah, how's it? Yeah, what I my mentor told me is to listen to the song. A, a well written song, a song will tell you what it needs. We just have to be quiet and listen. And that means um, putting your ego in check. Mm. Yeah, maybe we have an I I might have an idea that might be really cool or something different. Uh, but then I have to 
think, does that serve the song? Does that, uh, if I'm working, producing an artist, do my ideas create framework for the song that uh, he's written or she's written? And as a, I also pay attention to the timbre of an artist's voice and the, the delivery. Uh, I'll use Voldemar as an, as an example because some of the recordings he did prior to the record I worked on, they were great sounding recordings. His big complaint was these big, thick <laughs> tracks were put together. He came in at the very end to sing on it, and there was no place for him to sing. And he, and he was not given the time to uh, develop the song the way he thought vocally. That was, he always, he didn't like that feeling. So I told him, okay, what we'll do is we're going to, we're going to, uh, instead of sticking you in the framework, I'm going to build everything around you wow. until that performance is what you intended. And then by building the arrangement around it carefully, um, it, doesn't put uh, parameters on him, box him in so that he doesn't have the freedom to go here or there. Mm -hmm. Total space, but enough of a vibe for him to sing on. And that, uh, boy, I, for me, that came just from years of experience, uh, experience of doing it the other way, building great big tracks and having a singer come in and seeing, noticing that they, for pop music, it doesn't matter too much because they want the melody to be very strict. There's very few places to go. Jazz is another story. Jazz, you want that openness, that possibility of the unknown, the, the, uh, the beautiful accident <laughs> something that comes that's just totally unexpected and then building on that so my my thing is really knowing to the best of my ability what the heart is of the recording of the project and to build everything around it to make sure that what makes that artist unique uh, i don't box it in i don't do something that's going to uh, prevent them from going places that they may not even know. Mm -hmm. uh, many artists are, they're not looking at themselves in that way. They're looking at how they're being put together. And that's framed by what they hear on the radio. You know, maybe they, I want a record like this artist. I want a record like that artist. And, uh, you know, I would, if I, that were told to me, I'd say, well, it's kind of like already been done. I don't see the point. And if you, if you're doing that for trending sake, by the time we finish this record and it gets out the gate, it's already passe. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not interested in that kind of thing. But a record like Voldemar's will be around after generations. They will never get old. I, I love those kind of records. I think um, it's music. Yeah. You know, I always tell people I'm not the right person for many things. But for <laughs> that one thing, I will be the best person in the world. Uh, but I think right now uh, in this chapter of my life, I would like to encourage young artists to speak of my experiences and tell folks that it, dispelling any preconceived ideas that they may have that's preventing them from being who they know themselves to be. Uh, and it's, it's, to be empowering, you know, to being creative. Yes. So that's I bring all that in when I when I work with an artist. It's there are many great musicians, many great engineers. Um, I think my 
my gift is being sensitive to the artists and what it is they're trying to express and then creating a team around that. Yeah. And, and with so many years accumulated, um, that you accumulated as a professional producer, um, mm -hmm. how do you go about not repeating yourself, not doing the same thing again, for example, oh. and find the taste to, you know, to just create more and more and new stuff, new stuff. It's that what we, what I mentioned early on in the interview, it's, it's just being a curious person. Yeah. Uh, and also I'm fortunate that what I do is so diverse. I don't have a chance to do the same thing. You know, uh, uh, it, it, whether it's uh, genre uh, different or, or different idiom, uh, within the last six months, I I finished a record for um, uh, an old fr a dear friend of mine, uh, Nobuko Miyamoto, who was and is a vibrant Asian American activist through her songs. She's recorded music over thirty years. Um, she gave me an opportunity to produce my first record in Los Angeles. Was with her. Uh, the Smithsonian Folkways Records uh, wanted her to do a collection of her previously recorded works, and we ended up doing 11, 10 songs, 10 new songs, wow. you know, which some were reimagined, some were deep jazz, um, R&B, church, folk. So I had that record, you know, with the choir. It was It was really beautiful. It just got released. And right out of that, I went in and scored a documentary for a film called 100 Years from Mississippi about an extraordinary woman who left Mississippi when she was six because they were going to lynch her father and returned 100 years later to revisit the place that she was born. Uh, she passed away, I think, at 110 and saw the film before it was completed. So that that was a whole different type of music, whole different sensibility. Um, and now I'm starting a uh, classical violin piano record. You know, they, they, everything is different. I'm so fortunate. Everything is different. So I don't. Uh, I I'm not locked into one thing. It's constantly changing, and the circumstance, the music, the artists, I, I have to throw out any preconceived ideas and just start ground zero. Uh, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> I, yes, I'm not one of the guys that do the same thing all the time, the same type of production, the same type of score. Or I think I would be bored. <laughs> you know, and it's too much in life to just stick to one thing. But what I do see is the heart, the the thread that connects all of us through this, through music. In, in your identity, how did you, how do you um? So how do you found how did you find your identity in music, and how did music affect your identity at the same time? That is a, a hard one. Uh, I, I This is one subject I do speak to artists about, is I really did not know who I was as an artist. I felt I, I was always searching for my identity. And when I was on one thing, I would realize that that really wasn't, it's not me. It was... Uh, a byproduct of the circumstance that I was in mm -hmm. and, and not a very good one. So, uh, you know, whether if I were producing, um, there was a contemporary jazz pianist who is amazing, uh, Keiko Matsui. Mm -hmm. And I worked on 23 albums with her over wow. the years. One out, my favorite production that I was a part of 
was her record called Doll. And prior to that, her ex-husband, who was a producer, would have all these musicians coming in. And I would think it was like the, uh, we used to have a show here when I was a young kid, the Ed Sullivan show, different act, different musicians, you know, everybody coming in. It's like throw everything in the kitchen sink and just see what sticks. <laughs> but she, it wasn't, I would listen to the record and not know who she was. It was a beautiful sounding record, but I didn't know who she was. So I asked them if I could do a record where it was one group, one group of musicians. Um, and it was very conceptual and it was really focused on her. And she's a brilliant pianist, mm -hmm. beautiful melodies. And we did that. And that record is still one of my favorites today. Uh, but what I did for her was a record that I would have wanted to do for myself as a keyboardist. And after doing three records that were successful on this in the contemporary jazz market, and she it launched her career, um, I didn't want to, I could not come out with something like that. I would be called a copy of what she did even though I was part of the creation of it. Uh, and I didn't play like her. She's unbelievable. And I had a different style. So the long short is you go through all these things uh, to where two years ago, I realized that my style is nothing like the artists that I work with. It's very reflective, quiet, and people liked it. Uh, I just thought there was never an audience for it. Mm -hmm. And then I saw an artist from uh, Iceland perform. Uh, I loved his music, went to a concert here in Los Angeles, and it was sold out. I couldn't believe it. When my God, people want to hear that? That's what I do. <laughs> so I would say after being in... 40 years now in the recording business, I have a sense of who I am, my identity. And I'm working on music, uh, celebrating that. Uh, so, and because of that, I can speak to young artists and, and talk to them about the importance of listening to the voice that's inside and not uh, getting fooled or enamored or caught up in the things around them. You know, they, we have to be aware, but listen to what's inside. And I can tell them <laughs> it's powerful because I can tell them if you do not think that that's important, you're looking and speaking to the result of person of a person who did not do that in that yes. early year. Yeah. Uh, but I don't look at it as a as a bad thing. Um, it is some validation to knowing that truth that resonates with young people, young artists. That if a a person, one of their peers, said that to them, they go, "Ah, eh, you know, what do you know?" <laughs> I can say it, and it's a whole. <laughs> I do know. It's yeah. my experience, but maybe something will help you. So that's what I would like to, and this is a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. The positive side of the pandemic is it has forced us uh, to put a screeching halt on the busyness of life. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and forces <laughs> to look inward, yeah. uh, be comfortable in our, with ourselves, in our space, question about what we do. Is it really that important? Mm. Um, I've, I've learned a lot about myself in the course of, uh, this pandemic. Um, so I think it's a horrible thing that's happened and many, many, many lives have yeah. been lost. Uh, but there is, um, there is a positive too that can emerge from this, um, and I, I'm seeing some people do wonderful things, things that they never thought they could do. Yeah. 
so that's I think my that's where I'm finding my um, my musical identity mm -hmm. is in simplicity. And I believe that people are looking for truth. There's so much noise going on around us that they're looking for simplicity, a little quiet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's a good time. It's a wonderful time. Um, so um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that uh, pandemic brought to a lot of artists worldwide was uh, the ability to have their numbers, their streaming numbers uh, mm. growing. So that takes me to royalties, which is, uh, you know, basically a, a mechanism that has been in place to help artists, especially producers that are usually not in the spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, yes. you know, hey, this song is loud. You did the song, but then uh, there's a whole team, a whole team of creators, of creatives that uh, were involved. Yeah, but uh, through royalties, they can still earn um, credits for, for, for the work that they've done. Um, are you pro royalties and how has that worked out for you? Oh, boy, that is a model that is. Uh, it's the business has changed so much. It's not radio driven. Uh, anymore and uh and record sales traditional record sales are not there anymore yeah. so there has to be a a new paradigm of participation i i think an important thing oh boy it's a big that's a big question <laughs> <laughs> the important thing is education, 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 education on everything. Ignorance allows uh, people to be controlled. Um, so I feel that music, you know, when the old paradigm started leaving, artists there was less value placed on the importance of music and uh you know when napster there's a lot of talk about this but when muse downloading became uh easily attainable by everybody um but equally artists were giving away their music for free thinking that it was a, oh, it's a promotional tool. Mm -hmm. You got to give it away so people become aware of what we do. And I'm going, well, if you don't value it, how do you expect the other person to value it? Uh, I think with educating uh, people, listeners, is that... Um, you don't know how many years it took for a person to learn how to play their instrument, how many dollars it took to invest in creating the music that you're enjoying. And you wouldn't go to a restaurant, eat a meal and walk out and not pay for it. You wouldn't go to a contractor and have a house built and expect him to do it for free. Yet music is the thing that can bring a smile to someone's face or it's one of the most powerful things uh, that we have. You can't, and it's amazing because you can't see it, can't touch it, no smell. Mm -hmm. But yet it touches the human senses more than anything else. So I look at the artists that value what they do and work hard in finding the audiences that love what they do. And if the audience, if that connection is made, the audience supports what the artist is doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that artists 
need to be responsible in the in what they are creating and i believe artists have to um they have to be work hard to get the music out there i believe that they new partnerships have to be made any artist that feels that they can do it themselves is either a incredible genius <laughs> uh, uh you know and that's why i say education we need to work together yeah. people need to work together behind every successful artist nowadays there are a team of people moving doing things silently everybody aware of their contribution uh, everybody uh, new ways of developing participation so everybody uh, stands to will profit to be able to sustain themselves uh, i i don't have the answers for that but i know that if at least that dynamic begins the other part will follow i know artists of uh, there's one local singer here that I, i've worked with who does streaming on twitch and he and he has a very loyal fan base and he's he's not famous he doesn't have any uh, no charting records or anything and i asked him once you know, just almost uh, <laughs> A little sarcasm. He said, well, you, you spend so much time on Twitch. How many people do you have in your stream? And he goes, well, last night, 14,000. And I just said, what? Wow. Are you serious? He goes, yeah, well, you know, they go, they come on and off every so often, but this is cross country. And I thought, my God. <laughs> and how? then I started asking questions. How do you engage? And, go, and he told me how the model works with the tipping and this and that but his followers are so loyal he needed an electric guitar to do something uh and he created he was doing a streaming created a little tip jar and he made enough money in that one night to buy uh an electric he raised two three thousand us dollars wow and that's what I said. And I'm going, my, wait a minute. You know, he, <laughs> he works hard at it, but he found an audience. He's very personable. He's very happy and he's very loyal to them. And they equally are loyal to him. So I think the paradigm needs to be rebuilt. It'd be fun to see think tanks about that and, and people trying things and sharing the knowledge that they accumulate to to building what this whatever this new paradigm is to be but i believe artists need it's you know it's multiple things artists need to create responsible works they need to work hard to find their audience they need to have a team of people on how to get the music to in the best most engaging way to these artists mm -hmm. that in turn <laughs> you know the businesses that will help fund or build these new um new infrastructures that allow the music to get out yeah uh it can be a really cool thing but it's <laughs> going to take a community to do it to do it yeah, yeah. it, it has it has to and uh so, so you know with all these new forms and everything and uh going back to to jazz uh as yeah. a, a of making music do you consider yourself more conservative or you're more open to the new vibes to the new forms that it takes over the oh, time new forms i'm a believer in i think people you know the basic phrase where you need to know where you came from to know where you're going i believe uh there are people that love tradition and carrying on a tradition. And I think there are also people that, while respecting tradition, want to go somewhere else, have something else, another vision. Uh, for myself, as long as I see the heart and the truthfulness in it, I'm, I'm good. I'm down. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they really in music. There should be no rules. Yeah. It's pure expression. And I believe uh, it goes back to civil discourse and learning how to listen, learning how to be non-judgmental about everything. People are, I know, I find, you know, are very quick to judge. And if I question them on on that, I, I usually it falls because it there it masks their insecurities, their fears. So it's easier instead of addressing that, it's easier to put somebody else down and elevating themselves in the process. And I'm going, well, that doesn't really work. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> you know, we sometimes it's okay. It is oh no, not sometimes. It is okay for us to be human. Um we there's a lot. I, I am a non-traditionalist. I if it's done with heart, I'm good. I can appreciate all different um, aspects of jazz, all different aspects of music. Mm -hmm. Some I, I, I might say that I may not might not be my cup of tea, you know, not <laughs> but to judge it. And to say that it does not have purpose, uh, no, that's not my right. Um, well, I, <laughs> uh, uh, then I was going to say that I feel like, so we've been here for almost two hours. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and I feel like, um, you know, I still have a lot of things to ask. <laughs> but I... Um, <sighs> like, <laughs> I always tell folks, I warned them and I said, boy, if it comes, I loved your questions. I I read down the list and I went, oh, my God, but you, you carefully divided them up into three segments. And I go, my God, each one of those segments could be a couple hours. Yes. <laughs> and because there's so much information i think in those little things that i think might be helpful to somebody mm -hmm. um i never thought of i don't think of myself as an extraordinary in anything i think i was blessed with being in the right place at the right time i had really good mentors who taught me things the importance uh, when i was getting a little too full of myself <laughs> knew how to pull the plug <laughs> and put the boot up <laughs> the proverbial boot up the butt yeah <laughs> uh, i have witnessed things you know that um keep humility uh in mind when i see great people just being human exercising humility fragility of being a human being um, i've seen the destruction that fear does to people um, i've also seen what one the destruction that one unkind word can do to a person um, and when you witness things like this firsthand they become a part of your moral fabric um and i think when i meet folks like valdemar who speak he spoke to these truths uh, and i watched i've witnessed the way it reverberated or it lifted people people he did not even he might have met, met for the first time or people who heard him for the first time and walk up and say, my God, where have you been? <laughs> who are you? <laughs> uh, and, he, and he'd go, eh, I'm a singer. <laughs> but I, I've heard him say before, you know, he's, um, I wish, you know, the little, again, the little time, I don't want to speak like I've spent we spent a lot of time together in the making of that record. Mm -hmm. um, 
I had windows here to learn about him as a human being when he was living with his family in Santa Monica. And watching him smile and revel in the simplest things. You know, we, we walked from his apartment when he first moved here to a coffee shop and we walked back. And he was smiling and there's traffic. It's, it's kind of busy in Santa Monica. And he looked at me, he goes, you don't understand. For me to be able to walk down this street and not look over my back, you don't understand how that feels. You don't understand how it feels to sit here and just safely feel the sunshine on my face. And the pleasure that I get listening to the birds. I'll share one story, and this is true. When we were recording at my studio, uh, there's a song on the record called Umbi Umbi. Yes. And I swear to God, every time he sang that song, the birds would come out on the, uh, there was a telephone line outside the studio and they were loud. <laughs> And we were laughing in the room because sometimes they were so loud. They all little ones, but so many of them that it would get into the recording. And he'd laugh, you know. Uh, and when he stopped singing, birds would leave. And it wasn't just once. This happened several times. Uh, and when I was mixing the song, working on it, and he was in a. I think he might have gone back to Lisbon at that time. The birds came outside and started singing. And I held the phone up and said, Bonamai, you're not going to believe this. Listen, <laughs> I'm playing the song. The birds are going crazy. And he's laughing. He goes, see, they know. <laughs> this happened a lot with him. In you can't explain it. Defy defies logic, but I've seen it. I've witnessed it. Um, yeah, it, it, it's and the humility and the grace. Um, he was so when I see things like that uh, from a man like this, uh, I have no reason to think otherwise, and I have very little patience um, for folks who think like that. We're all human you know we we have our differences and uh, but there are many and those differences should be celebrated our uniqueness but we i think we're entering a time where we need to see our the threads that connect us and i know i'm speaking so much but that is the importance of jazz that is the importance of international jazz day uh, this collection of musicians. Um, look at what Angola is doing. You know, lack of having a, a filled audience, mm -hmm. televising, streaming it, uh, concentrating on the internet to get information out. It's probably going to get more, potentially you could get more uh, notoriety in this yeah. new paradigm. It's forcing people to think differently. Do different things. Look at us doing this interview, <laughs> you know, halfway across the world. Uh, <laughs> and I'm so grateful to you for reaching out and asking, Mashana, for uh, you know, for setting this up. Uh, this is fun. I would do. <laughs> this is important. It's important. Uh -huh. And I'm also very grateful to you uh, for accepting right away, for being so um, kind, you know, and and such, so easygoing, and that was that was great. That was just uh, a great yeah. experience. I said I, I I read about you, and even though you don't see yourself as that, you know, if if we stop and look um, at everything you've done, at to every song you have contributed, you have. Um, you have had your, you know, fingerprints on very important pieces of the story. So 
even though you may not see yourself as that, um, I can see yourself as that, you know, I can see you as that because <laughs> you can recognize, you know, several. So what would be Bel Yashika if, if, if you hadn't, if you haven't had your, 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 your fingerprint on it, for example, what would be, you know, other different records and other different albums and, and specific records that you've worked on. So um, I feel like we should appreciate um, people like that, especially when they're still alive, especially when they, when we can still talk to them. <laughs> yes. I, I, I hate the, um, I mean, I love the, I actually love the the, the 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 saying that say people never get the flowers while they ki- the while they can still smell them. So yeah. uh, so for me, it's, I, I I you know I I put in my mind that I will make it a mission to you know it, whenever I can just tell people's story, uh, especially when they're not uh, on spotlight as they should. Mm. For example, so for me is it's an honor and an honor and I'm oh. really you thanks thanks thank thank you derek <laughs> oh, my pleasure is mine and <laughs> any any time i i uh i used to tell i tell people this you know i i am not um i'm easily found mm-hmm. uh, but equally i don't do much on in the way of promoting myself or putting myself out there so whoever shows up at my door, there is a reason. I've always believed that. Every artist that showed up there was it was almost divine intervention. There was something that I was to do for that person or that artist. Um and it's a it's a privilege. And I believe that was what I have tried to do in every uh, situation, every scenario that I've been in, musically or uh, anything, is to see how I can, what can I do to make a positive contribution, mm-hmm. um, to elevate the situation. And sometimes it could be to say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that that can be helpful too uh, and through this entire process uh, I'm the one who is learning constantly learning uh, reevaluating um, reflecting and the privilege is um, not feeling that I know more than anybody else but when opportunity presents itself to share that perspective as food for thought Mm -hmm. to the other other person um i i i told valdemar when on my first trip to angola because he spoke of um he would always introduce me and mention having work with uh, with michael jackson Mm -hmm. and i would say god you know i that was such a small (laughs) there are guys who work with him a lot my old mentor work with him every day but at the same time it was it was honest you know there there was a that pivotal window where we did i did have that experience Mm -hmm. and i learned so much about him and the business that became it became a part of the fabric of my life Mm -hmm. and it did shape what i uh gave me something clarity in how I see people, all the experiences that I've had. Um, it, it really has helped me be of service to others, having this diverse range of experiences with all kinds of musicians and all kinds of scenarios. So, and I, and I think, uh, I think the next chapter is going to be really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't wait. Definitely. And we'll be here to testify it. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful festival coming up this weekend. Yes. Um, and I do look forward to uh, visiting Luanda. 
and seeing your country uh you know the last trip was very short uh this trip you know unfortunate because of covid mm -hmm. but i think because of dialogue like this and meeting ophili mm -hmm. i think from unesco and lashana and, and her help um something good is going to happen oh definitely <laughs> You know, so I I am very grateful, very very grateful. You're welcome. We'll be here um, to show you around um, once again. <laughs> Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, as I told you, please uh, a round of applause to Derek Nakamoto. Oh, <laughs> my! <laughs> I felt that. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Um, anytime I'm here. Likewise.